Genesis chapter 7. I probably should have saved that for the introduction for Genesis. So consider that a freebie for Genesis chapter 7 that won't be on the, on the tape, uh, what surrendering is, because we saw last week Noah, who was just totally surrendered to the Lord, right? Of all the people in, in the world, billions, there was one man, Noah. The Lord said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. And Noah said, what's an ark? Noah, rain's coming and you have to be ready. What's rain? Noah, go get wood and get pitch and start building. But I don't understand, but I'll do it. Noah, I'm going to bring you animals. I'm going to bring so many of these kind and so many of those kind, and I want you to let them in and close yourself in because when the flood comes, it will destroy the whole world. Okay, Lord. He was a man of obedience. He followed the commandments of God. Because he followed the command of God means that he loved God with all his heart. Because John tells us in the New Testament, interpreting the Old, that if you follow my commandments, it's because you love me. If you love me, follow my commandments, John said. And Noah loved God with all of his heart. That if God would have told Noah to stand on his head, Noah said, okay, how long, Lord? That's how much he loved the Lord. If, Noah would have, if God would have told Noah to do something outlandish like he did to Jeremiah, go in and play with mud and make little figures and so forth. Okay, Lord, I, get, I don't get it, but okay. If God had told some of the prophets to do what they had done, and yet they were okay in doing it, no matter what. No matter what. It was evidence of their love for God. And may I say this too? That even in your rebellious state, as long as you come around to a place where you're obedient to God, he will be there for you. Really? Where do you find that in scripture? Read the book of Jonah. You see Jonah who was rebellious against the Lord. And the Lord never left him. Jonah was his child and he loved him. And he knew that he had a plan for him and he was going to allow him to, within his rebellious state to do what he needs to do until he brings him right around to Nineveh. And he did. And ultimately, even though he didn't like it, he went and he preached to Nineveh and he sat there until the shrub grew over him complaining, wishing that he'd die, but the Lord was still there. I, I find so much comfort in that, that even in our rebellious states, because we have a love and a heart for Jesus. Deep down inside, we've given him our hearts, just like Noah, just like Moses, just like Paul, just like the disciples. And yeah, they were failures when you look at their lives. King David was a failure and he suffered the consequences. But God loved them and God kept them because they were his children. They were his children. And we see that in Noah's life. But the rest of the world will be destroyed. You'll find that if you stick with the Lord... He will get you through the storms of life. He really will. I read something today and they said, why do storms come? And that's usually the question that we always ask. Why is this happening? And, and sometimes there's really no answer but that we live in the world. You can probably find several answers if you read scriptures. You know, well, why was this man blind from birth? And Jesus said, for no reason at all. Was his mother or his father? No, no. So that God would receive glory when he heals him of his blindness. That could be why you're going through something. So that when God delivers you, when he gets you through the storm, that you give him glory. And those that see you glorify God too because they know that only God could get you through that. But we don't know for sure. And we probably won't know. But we are told that God will always get us through. All the way until we get to heaven. And I thank him for his faithfulness. And so chapter 6 warns us of the flood. Chapter 7 then gives us the flood. And so the theme this evening is the flood. And we're going to look at this whole chapter, verses 1 through 10, Noah and his family, and, and the living creatures that God will bring into the ark. And then 11 through 16, the flood will begin as God locks them in that boat and then begins to destroy and judge the world. And then 17 through 20, it's flooding for 40 days. 40 days. And possibly not necessarily flooding in the sense that rain is coming down, but even beyond that, 
the waters are still coming from the center of the earth into uh, in, on top of the earth there itself. And then 21 through 22, all flesh is, is totally, totally destroyed. Gone. Man, woman, child, everything. God starts all afresh and anew. And then the, the length of uh, the flood there in verse 24. So let's look at Noah and his family in verses 1 through 10. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Uh, the ark was finished by Noah through faith because he was obedient to the Lord and it took faith for him to build the ark. It is faith that God sees. He tells us that in Hebrews, that without faith, you're unable to please God. Noah pleased God. Noah was... Uh, pleasing to the Lord and God appreciated it so much that he saved Noah and his family and Hebrews tells us in eleven seven, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen yet moved with fear uh, there's that healthy fear that we talked about on Sunday right there is a healthy fear that he feared God more than he feared man uh, he feared the Lord's reverence and, and he loved him that, that he was going to be obedient to the Lord. And so because of that godly fear, he prepared the ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And so when God calls him righteous in verse 1 and then in Hebrews it says a righteousness which comes by faith, he's talking about the righteousness of Jesus Christ not his own righteousness, that righteousness that has been imputed uh, to Noah at that moment and has been imputed to us. So we are righteous before the Lord. That's a struggle for some of us because we know that we're sinners and we fall short. You know, a surrendered life, surrendered life will recognize their own sin when they're surrendered. You ever meet someone that just has all the answers? You ever meet someone that just seems like they know everything and that when they're in a difficulty, they know exactly what to do? You ever meet someone like that and what they do or the plans they make, they never go wrong? Uh, they, it's like they know everything and everything's just, it, it, and it's like all around them, right? That's a person that's not surrendered to Jesus Christ because, oh, I know I'm right, you know, oh, no, I'm not wrong, you know, and, and I don't see it. And, you know, that's not a person surrendered because a person surrendered will see their own sinfulness and their need for a savior. And they will surrender to Jesus knowing that it's Jesus' righteousness that they need. And so his righteousness gets imputed to us. Now, uh, it took me a long time to understand that because I'm like, how does he give me that righteousness? Because I don't feel like it sometimes, but does it like come in me? I mean, there's like a force field around me of righteous. What, what is it? I don't get it. No, it's in a, our account. You know, you might have a thousand dollars in your account, so so you have a thousand dollars, but you don't carry it with you. But you have a thousand dollars; it's with you. It's in your account. Jesus' righteousness is in our account. If you were a millionaire, I could call you a millionaire because you have a million dollars in assets, and and you so you are a millionaire, but you don't have it with you. But yet you're a millionaire because it's in your account, and so the righteousness of Jesus is in our account. We are righteous because of Him. Now Noah, in the spirit of faith which had influenced him and his old conduct waited for the direction of the Lord from that point on. He's built the ark. I'm ready, Lord. What do we do now? And an interesting observation here is that the Lord said to Noah, what? Come, come. The first time that the word come is mentioned. And it's interesting when you look up the word come there that God would call Noah to come into the boat. Uh, this is the first time this word is spoken in the Bible, but it is not the last. For from cover to cover, the Lord says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white as snow, Isaiah 118. He wants us to come and reason with him, to confess our sins, and he wants to make us white as snow. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, he said, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I love that. Because when I am weary and heavy laden with sin, with life, with struggles, I can 
come to Jesus and sit at his feet. How do I do that? I simply go to my room and, and either I lay in the bed or I get on my knees or I come to church. Or I find a place where I just, I just begin to pour my heart out to Jesus. Sometimes that's in the middle of the night. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just like, Jesus, I love you. you know. And I start talking to him and praying and pouring. And he wants us to come. He loves it when we come. Revelation twenty two seventeen. Whosoever is thirsty, let him come and drink of the water freely. And so Jesus is about coming to him. Uh, you, if you're thirsty, if you need help, if you need a quenching uh, from sin, from whatever, and you need a drink, come to Jesus and he will fill you. You and your household, he said. Now, I, I love the fact that, that it wasn't just Noah, but it's you and your household. There's something that's said about a man who covers his home and he's responsible for his home. And in this place, because of Noah's faith and trust and obedience, God saw that and saved his whole family. Just like Cornelius was also saved and his family. And it's interesting that the Lord not only saved Noah, but his family. And the Lord does that quite a bit. I, I remember when I first got saved and I was just, I was the most wretched person that I could, that I ever known. And I know me. Uh, I'm wretched. Deserved to go to hell, totally. Didn't argue the point. And God comes down and he saves my soul. And I didn't deserve it. But I was, <clears throat> I was so grateful. I, it was just like my life just flipped. And people flipped out when they saw me because it wasn't the same me. It was like, what happened to him? My dad said, oh, you're going through a religious phase and you'll outgrow it, you know. That was 30 years ago. Um, people would say, you know, uh-oh, he's in a cult, you know. But I was so excited that it wasn't about me. It was about my wife. It was about my children. It was about my mom. It was about my sisters, my brothers, my neighbors, my friends. And I just started sharing my faith with anybody and everybody that I could imagine. And God was so gracious to save my whole family. My wife came to the Lord. My boys have come to the Lord. All of my boys know the Lord. And all of their children know the Lord. So from this point, point on in my family we all know a hundred percent know the lord my mom knows the lord my two sisters know the lord we're still working on my brother but god is in the business of saving family he doesn't stop with you and neither should you you need to take that and you need to run with it and watch how god will save your entire family verse 2 gives us the direction look at verse 2 you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal a male and his female and two each of animals of that are unclean a male and his female also seven each of birds of the air male and female uh, birds be, because probably you know they can fly so long and then they need a place to land and rest so uh, that's why the birds other male and female to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. So Noah is to take on board about seven pairs of every clean animal, male and female, and one pair of every unclean animal, male and female. Now these were, the clean animals were to be used for the sacrifices. Well, how did Noah know to sacrifice? Well, you remember in the Garden of Eden that God prepared a covering for Adam and Eve that was the first sacrifice and then Cain and Abel came Cain brought his own offering God said uh -uh, that's not what I required what did I require the offering that Abel brought the sacrifice of a lamb and so it has been passed down from generation to generation what the Lord had required so even though the law is not in existent at this point the Ten Commandments doesn't come until Exodus right what chapter 20 or so they're not living under a law, but yet the law is there because God says you have to offer up a sacrifice. Uh, you are to be obedient to the Lord. You know, love the Lord God with all thy heart, mind, and strength. First commandment, you know. You are to keep the Sabbath because they're to rest on that. It was all there. And they were doing it out of what? Love. 
It was all being done out of love to God and because God asked of it. What happened then was is that they began to sin. And so God be, had to show them their sin. And that's when they were in bondage to Egypt. And then they came out of Egypt. And then God wrote the Ten Commandments to show them that they are sinners. Because you are to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the first commandment, to love God. And so if you don't love God, then you have broken the commandment. You understand? And, and we have broken that commandment. Before Christ, I have broken that commandment. And there are many that say they're in Christ, but they don't love God like Noah loved God. They don't love God like David loved God. They don't love God like Paul and the apostles loved God. They're not surrendered to the Lord because they're not being obedient to him. So they've broken that commandment. Not only that, they're still under the law, and the law will judge them. That's the thing. Don't be deceived. Their eyes need to be open. So it was a sacrifice, not to appease the law, but to appease God. And so he gave them enough of the clean animals. And if there were only two and, and one was killed, of course, obviously, the, the species wouldn't be extinct. And that was pretty smart of God to think of that. Yeah, smart God. So about 7,000 species could fit in that ark. Remember that the number seven represents completion. On the seventh day, God rested. It was done. It was over. The number 40 speaks of judgment. So it says in verse four, for after seven more days, so the completion, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And by the way, only God can do that. God is the one that has the right to destroy. He created it. He has every right. I know we sometimes uh, question that. Well, what gives God the right? Well, he made it. You know, he's God. That, that's another aspect of our surrendering to him. Uh, he knows something you don't know. He, he's all-knowing, all-present. He's eternal. So, I mean, you, you may not respect him in that sense, and you think you know better than him. Well, that's sin. In fact, that's pride, and that's what caused Satan to fall. So you have to be willing to say, God, I totally trust you. And if you want to destroy my life, then, hey, who am I? I'm just a created being. You're God. You're God, not me. And so I have to surrender myself to you, Lord. And if you want me to stand on my head, I will stand on my head, Lord. I can't do that, so don't show that display. But whatever the Lord wants. So he gives them a week here. For them to repent one week, the world. Let's see if they will repent, if they will turn. Because they know it's coming too. And they probably mock, mocked and laughed and ridiculed Noah through the whole thing. 120 days that Noah worked on it. 120 years that he worked on it. And, and they probably came by every once in a while throwing rocks, you know, laughing and ridiculing him and, and, and so forth. But the Lord gave them one more week to see if they would repent. And that is a strange pause when you really think about it after giving them so long. <clears throat> Luke 17, 27 says, They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. That's not life, by the way. That is not life. Jesus is describing the world that Noah lived in. The world ate, drank, married. In other words, they went on with life. And there are Christians like that. Well, I, I work to support my family. Okay, we all do. Well, you know, we have parties and, and, and events and Christmas and holidays. and So we do family things. Okay, well that's, that's wonderful. I mean, we all do that too. You know, we all, our daughters are being given to marriage. Our sons are getting married. Yeah, well, we all do that too. Well, that's life. No, that's not life. That's life on this earth. We all do that, but there's more to, to life for the believer. The life that's surrendered, there is the kingdom of God. That kingdom of God that exists spiritually and we're all a part of. That is the spiritual life that Noah was a part of, that David was a part of, that, that uh, Samuel was a part of, that Samson was a part of. You know, these guys were a part of the kingdom of God, and, and the commands of God were given to them as they went out. And so we need to be a part of the kingdom of God. If you're just in the world, and, and you're not serving the Lord, if, if you're not in the kingdom of God, if you're not supporting the church, you know, if you're not um, dedicated to the ministries, 
uh, then something's wrong. You're just in the world. You're not in the kingdom. And you can't have a foot in each side, you know, because, hey, well, I want to make sure I'm saved. You know, got to go to church on Sunday. And, but I also want to just live my life, enjoy some of those things that I missed. You know, I, I married Virginia at 18. She got pregnant at 15, 16 years old. I missed my high school life. <laughs> you know, I didn't get to do some of the things that, that uh, what do they call it? What does the world say? I didn't uh, sow my wild oaks, in a sense, right? Uh, I didn't get to enjoy a lot of things. And so I thought, at the age of 21, and now that I have a great job with Edison, I'm going to enjoy my life now. And so I would leave my wife and the kids, and I'd go partying Tuesday nights because it was a special night at the at the uh, restaurants that had bars. And I'd go with the guys, and we would go to their, their pad first, and we would snort... Uh, snort some cocaine, actually inhale it, you know, and stuff, take some marijuana, and, and then go out to the party, because I'm going to enjoy life. I missed my life, you know. I was in the world. That's the world. You know, as I look back and at it from this perspective, being a Christian, well, I didn't miss anything. It wasn't worth it. It just destroyed and killed what I thought was going to be pleasing. Kind of like the children of Israel. Well, at least in Egypt we had onions and cucumbers. No, you didn't. You were in bondage. You didn't have any of that. You grew it for the Egyptians. You know, but we always think it's better on that side. It is not. I guarantee you, you're headed in the wrong direction if you're thinking that it's going to be better. Now you can live life. No, no, no. This life is so much better. I love this life. I enjoy this life. I got, I got to renew someone's vows yesterday at the Mission Inn. What a blessing that was. I was more blessed than they were. I mean, they, you know, they were a beautiful couple and, and beautiful place. And this guy was a, a romantic, made, made me look <laughs> bad, you know. But, but, man, went all out, you know. And, and, and I'm sure they were blessed, but I was more blessed. I'm like, first of all, who am I to even be here? You know, and, and be able to see all this beauty. I mean, I was taking pictures all over the place. I had performed this uh, ceremony there years ago. But just being there again, and my wife was there, and we were both there enjoying this, watching them. Uh, we were all hiding while they're sitting at a table, and she's crying as he's talking with her. And, you know, and I'm just, we, we just started crying all back there. It's like, wow, I wish we could hear what they were saying. And it was just, I loved it. I was more blessed than them. And then they wanted us in the pictures. We're like, no, no, we're not even a part of your family. No, no, come on, come on. I'm like, really? No, 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 no. We felt so, you know, awkward. And finally, we just said, no, we got to go. <laughs> you know, and we, we left. But what a blessing. I loved that more than that marijuana, that Coke, or that nightclub that I went to. Um, that was sick. That's the world. But the kingdom of God is totally different, and we need to be in the kingdom of God. They ate, they drank, and they married. There's more to life than that. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Faithful Noah. Oh, how we ought to be like Noah. First Peter 3.20 When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. God is faithful because Noah was faithful. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeped on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded. Notice verse 9. Two by two, they went into the ark to Noah. Uh, I have had that question asked. Well, how did Noah round up all those animals real quick? They went into the ark to Noah. That's how. God somehow supernaturally went to the animals and said, head in this direction. Noah was just standing there and watching God bring them all in. He's able to do that, you know. He really is. Balaam got on a donkey, was headed to the king of Moab, Barak. And as he was coming to a little valley where two rocks were, the donkey stopped. 
and he starts smacking the donkey. Kind of like what he has to do to us sometimes to get us moving, right? Because we're not listening. And finally, the donkey turns around and says, why are you hitting me? <laughs> I'm like, that is so strange. The donkey just starts talking to him. And what's even stranger is, is Balaam talks back. <laughs> well, get moving. And then he, he, he's even more spiritual than Balaam. Well, don't you see there's angels there ready to strike you, you know? Really? You know? If God can make a donkey speak, you know, he can create animals that come to the ark. Jesus told Peter, go put your pole in the water. And the first fish that you catch, open its mouth, and there'll be the taxes that we need to pay to the government. Really? So, so what did it take to get that fish? With the, did he go and swallow some money? I mean, how long has it been in his tummy? You know, who put it there? You know, and all of a sudden, the fish. Come on, I've been to derbies in, in Bishop. You know, and if you get the fish that's got the strap, you know, you win fifty bucks. And if you got a blue strap or red strap, five hundred bucks, and so forth. In fact, we had gone one time, and my brother-in-law, the day before the derby, got one with a strap. And so you can just imagine the debate. Do we hold on to it till the next day and then say we got it? Or do we illegally catch it and we really shouldn't claim it at all because it was a winner? You know, so it wasn't any of that. God just phew, put the money in the fish somehow, and it bit on the bait, was there waiting for Peter. And boom, God can do that. God can definitely do that. Uh, how did the fish that swallowed Jonah spit them right up on Nineveh? You know, uh, God talked to him. Was he on his way? We we don't know, but somehow he spit them right on Nineveh, and he just had to walk over and boom, because he was headed in what the Bible says the opposite direction, and the fish brought him right back. <clears throat> so as John Corson says, uh, Noah didn't have to round up any of the animals. Just like in the Garden of Eden, God brought all the animals to Adam. Verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. Now we come to verse 11 through 16. The flood begins. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, of the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Oh, just really quick there. The fountains of the great deep. That means the center of the earth was cracked open. Uh, I was reading an article, I think uh, six months ago or so, and I'm trying to remember it all, but basically what it was saying is the scientists have found that un underneath the earth, in the earth, there is so much water it could cover the whole earth. Uh, they made that claim themselves. They said that without thinking that there was a flood on the earth at one time, Right? And now we have the evidence that scientists have said there's enough water there that it could come out if it was able to come out and it would fill the whole earth. Yeah. This thing on the Grand Canyon, it's, it's amazing. Uh, have you ever flown over the Grand Canyon? Anybody? Over and through Arizona? Uh, I have got the opportunity on my way back from Israel to fly over the Grand Canyon. And, and as I was flying over, I'm like, wow. You can actually see where the water was and how the water flowed down as it was draining, and it made all these canyons and so forth. It's amazing when you have that perspective, and not billions and billions and billions of erosion and, you know, that type of perspective. That takes more faith than believing God. It broke up, and the windows of heaven were open, so also rain came upon. And scientists have suggested that, it, you know, 40 days of rain would not have covered the earth. I, I believe him. It wasn't just the rain. It was the center of the earth too. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. 13. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's son, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. So Noah and his family boarded the ark, but notice that Noah went first here. I think there's a message there for us, guys. God saved Noah and his family. God tells them to go into the ark. Noah went in first. There's a message there for us, guys, about being leaders in the home. I, I 
felt led to teach a message on Sunday about marriage because it's Valentine's Day. But that's a secular thing, so I wasn't sure if I should do it. But there's a message here about what the role of a man really is. <clears throat> and I don't think that we, we fulfill that role very well. I know I haven't. <clears throat> I've messed up quite a bit. And from all my mistakes, I could probably share with you some things so that hopefully you don't make the same mistakes. But there's a message here about being a godly man, a man of integrity, a man that obeys God, a man that leads his wife to the Lord, a man that loves gently and cares for his wife, that thinks more highly of her than he thinks of himself. And yet I failed in all those. <laughs> Big time. And something to be said about a woman who has grace. And that is what it is, grace and mercy for their husbands because they make a lot of mistakes. I don't believe that a Christian man intends to purposely, though I'm sure there are some. But I believe that it's because of their lack of discipleship, their lack of searching out the scriptures, possibly reading books to learn what it is to be a man the head of the home but there's a message here and the message truly is is that when you are a man of God and as you're leading the way God wants you to lead the Lord will bless you so they boarded the ship as a whole family they and every beast after its kind all the cattle after their kind every creeping thing that creeped on the earth after its kind so you can imagine the crickets I wish the uh, the little termites would have stayed back but they didn't or the cockroaches you know I'm going to have to ask on those. Why, why let those guys come on, you know? There, ha there had to be a male. Oh, wait, wait, just one cockroach, I guess, right? They don't need a male or female, some of them. So, you know, just all the worms, just all the mosquitoes, you know, all, everything was, was on the bird. It just came, all, every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered male, female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. Highlight that in verse 16. The Lord shut him, shut him in. The original Hebrew says covered him round about. It was the Lord that shut him in. That suggests that Noah had become the special object of divine grace and protection, right? Because it was the Lord that shut the door on him. Not like the movie that came out, Noah, and you see the people climbing in and they actually get into the ark. They couldn't do that. There was only one door and God completely shut it. Possibly it was maybe even underwater by now, so you, there's just no way you're going to open up that door. But the Lord shut him in. He was going to protect him. He was going to be his atonement. That is definitely grace. Matthew 25.10 says, While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut for who for those who were ready you know god is readying his bride these last days he really is yes there are some falling away falling away but god is readying his wife his bride he is calling them back to the churches a friend of mine just uh, called me last night he was just so excited and like well something just he goes you won't believe this he was on his way home and he's in his vehicle and he's worshiping the lord he's listening to uh that 89.9 and he's just worshiping the lord and all of a sudden as he's driving he sees this car that's kind of come you know how there's usually a car next to you and they're kind of following you home because they're in the same direction all of a sudden he looks over and the man is weeping so he rolls the window down and the guy says your music why is it making me cry? And he's like, it's 89.9. Put it on your radio. Listen to it and believe. And your life will change. Your life will change. The Lord is calling his people back. What an experience. The guy just crying because of music. That's a, that is a divine appointment right there. Amazing. But I know also the enemy is hardening hearts. He's hardening the hearts of many that they will not listen. 
I think this evidence of the last days. I think that we should be careful that we're in God's protection and that we're ready eating ourselves for the wedding feast and not fighting against it. Can I share with you what John Corson uh, said? I hope it's okay. I know it's probably okay with him. He would say, go, f go for it, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> now the, this is what he said. Now the door is shut and Noah and his family are sealed in the ark. There's no way for them to open the door and escape or change their mind. This speaks to me because the one who said, I am the door, let us know we are likewise secure in our salvation. You are in my hands, Jesus declared. I'm trying to speak like I'm living. And no man can pluck you out. Do I believe in eternal security? He says, yes, I do. I am absolutely secure because the Lord has shut me in. It, was, it wasn't Noah who shut the door on the ark, hoping he'd latch it right and that it would somehow stay shut. God shut the door in the ark just as he sealed our salvation on our journey to heaven. But wait a minute. You say, I thought there will be some who won't make it into, the, into heaven even though they once made a profession in Christ. John said, that's absolutely true. I believe the story that most clearly explains this dichotomy deals with a ship like an ark and a storm like the flood. On a ship bound for Rome, Paul advised the captain to winter in port due to bad weather. You remember that story? Ignoring Paul's advice, they sailed on right into the storm, which grew so fierce that the sailors feared for their lives. Be of good cheer, Paul said. There stood by me this night an angel of God, who I am, who I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God has given thee all them that sail with thee. Acts 27, 22. When the storm continued, some of the sailors decided to bail out. But just as they were about to leave, Paul said, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. In other words, if you choose to go overboard, you'll be wiped out. You are secure, safe, sealed only as long as you stay on board. No one can pluck us out of the hand of God, but that doesn't mean that we, can, we can't leave on our own. Yes, I sin, but I'm determined and decided that I will love the Lord all the days of my life. You have to be determined. That's what I said earlier. The Lord knows everything about me. And do I sin? Yes, I sin. Do I fall? Yeah. But I confess it to Him every day. And my hope is in Him. <clears throat> like Billy Graham said when he was asked by a reporter if you wanted to hear the praises of anyone who would it be he said Jesus he says well, what would you like to hear I'd like to hear well done good and faithful servant and because he was trying to witness to this guy he said but I don't think I'll hear them I don't think I'll hear those words if Billy Graham won't hear those words what made that guy think that he could stand before God? But he was trying to make a point to him that he needs to be saved. I don't think I'll hear those words. I, I really don't, honestly. I would be so glad just to make it. So the flood comes. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days, verse 17. The waters increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. So that could mean that because of the, the waters that were flowing, that were still kind of lifting them up even though the rain had stopped. And the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth and the ark moved about the surface of the waters. And the waters pre prevaileth exceedingly on the earth and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered and the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered so 22 and a half feet above the summit of the highest hills uh, they were all covered a total flood of the whole earth this is describing here i know that they describe a partial flood possibly in that area but that's not true there's so much evidence of it that uh, that they have not hold those in school it's just ridiculous how they find animals that were in certain locations out in Alaska and in different places because you can only imagine and when all these animals are dying and people are dying they're just floating all over the world it's just going all over the world so 
There's just so much evidence. And, and, you know, I really encourage you to get Kent Hovind's series. It definitely is a great series on all of this and explains it very well, very simply too. Um, again, surrendering yourself, getting to learn about the Lord. Check this out. It will help you. It will definitely help your children as they uh, listen to the public school teachers all day long telling them, no, you weren't created, you evolved. You need to battle that with something. And, and a lot of times it's good videos because they love watching videos. And so uh, with our kids, we used to um, make them watch it. If they played an hour on games, hey, you need to give an hour to the Lord then. And we made them give an hour. I'm sure they got away with 45 minutes, I'm sure, because they're sinners. But they definitely listen to those videos. So I think the, the, the language here really suggests that it was a total flood. And then all the flesh was destroyed. Look at verse 21. And all the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, every man. So destroying beasts along with all of humanity besides Noah and, and his family uh, was necessarily that the beasts should uh, not outnumber Noah and his family. Uh, the Lord's judgment is severe but done in great wisdom here. It says, all in whose nostrils was a breath of the spirit of life. All that was on the dry land died. All that had life. Not that they had the spirit of God, but they had the life, the, the life of God in them. Every one of them died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained. Peter comments on this in, uh, on verse 23 here in Second Peter 2, 5. He says, Spare not, He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood the world of the ungodly. Noah was also a preacher. So as he's also working on the ark, He's also preaching about the flood and the judgment of God that is coming. Just saw a video of a guy standing, uh, the second one now, uh, standing on public streets, sidewalk, and he is preaching the gospel to those in the DMV. This happened in Hemet uh, a couple of years ago. Police came and arrested them, said that they're gathering unlawfully. No, they broke the law because they are disturbing the peace. What about our rights for free, free speech, you know, is asked. So this video it just came out, and this guy's got a blowhorn, not an a, a electronic one, but just like a, a, a tube, cardboard tube, and he's just screaming out. And so DMV, I guess it's the, it's the spot to go to if you want to be arrested for preaching the gospel. And he's preaching the gospel, and so now he's, he's confronted by the police officers. You need to stop. This is illegal. How is it illegal? I, I get a right to free speech. Not with that thing you can't. Well, why can't I use that thing? It doesn't say I can't use that thing. You're breaking a lot. Where am I breaking? And they're going back and forth. So finally, the officer just grabs him, cuffs him, and takes him off uh, into his vehicle. To, to, and he said, to show you the law. You know? And he showed him the law. Uh, Noah preached. He was a man of righteousness that preached the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the world. He didn't have a problem standing on any corner. There were no laws or police officers back then, so they had to just listen to him. I'm sure they threw stones at him. I'm sure they got upset, screamed and yelled and laughed and mocked. I miss those preachers. We need them in these last days. <clears throat> you know, sometimes we get upset at personalities because their personalities are, are a little hard, maybe. Maybe the word that they preach is a little hard, but boy... It'd be nice to have a John the Baptist once in a while, right? Or Noah that preached a message of righteousness. Um, pastors are so different from each other. And we should embrace the message and not necessarily their style. But if what they're saying is true, then support that. Encourage that. Because that's who God has made them, just as he made you. And so style should not even be an issue. Maybe you should change your style. Maybe they'll receive you more. Maybe you should learn to speak 
you know. I was in a meeting with some, some pastors, and <clears throat> one of them said they were really feeling like a calling to being pastors, but someone came to them and said, first you have to learn to speak. And he got so mad, but he saw that, yeah, maybe I need to. So he ended up hiring somebody. And I thought about that too, going to, going to school or hiring somebody to learn to speak. But I remember what Chuck always said, why would you try to better yourself than what God is already doing in the Spirit? Are you going to add anything to that? God is the one that's in control of the message. He's the one that gives you the message. If they get hear, then they'll hear. If they don't, they won't. But God will bring the ones that he wants to hear. Why do you think going to school and bettering yourself is going to increase the message, you know? Like if you can build upon the Holy Spirit moving, you can't. God, I miss Chuck. Those simple points of wisdom. We want to just do it ourselves. And let's do this instead of letting the Holy Spirit just lead. But just drive down the street worshiping the Lord. You never know. Some guy may look at you and he's weeping because the Spirit is moving. You could not plan that. You could not organize that. You could not teach a class on how to make the guy in the car cry playing the worship music. That's a moving of the Holy Spirit. What we need is more men and women filled with the Holy Spirit that are willing to stand on their head if God says, stand on your head, you know, and then let the Lord do his work he was a preacher of righteousness how long did the flood last and the waters prevailed on the face of the earth 140 or yeah 50 days 150 days so <clears throat> had more to say but we're running out of time let me just close up just just one thing and, and i think it's important because this message yes it's about the judgment but i think it's more than that it is about God's faithfulness to us because he pulled Noah out. But Noah was pulled out because he was a man of righteousness. He was a man of integrity. And we need men and women of righteousness and integrity today. So men, be leaders in your homes. Do it by faith, by trusting in Jesus, and finding out exactly what you need to do to be those men. Read your Bible. Pick up some good books by people that are writing about husbands and wives and children. Dr. Dobson, you can't go wrong by getting all of his books. Go to the bookstore and get them all and read them. If you can't read, that's not an excuse. Go buy the book on cassette. Oh, not cassette anymore, CD. Or, I'm sorry, download it. E-book it. You can do that. No excuse. They, ha they have it there for anybody if you, if you can't read. I mean, it's there. We just have to work for it to be the men that we should be.